Hello and welcome to the Euractiv Policy Triangle Debate. My name is Dave Keating and today we're going to be talking about the packaging and packaging waste regulation. This has been a big law going through the EU legislative process over the past months. It's been subject to a lot of attention, a lot of lobbying, because it involves a lot of different stakeholders and it's going to have a big impact on consumers in terms of the type of packaging you're going to be seeing over the coming years. So we're very lucky to be joined by some of the experts on this file who have been dealing with it exhaustively over the past months. Uh, so let me introduce them to you now. We have here with us Oral Siobhanu Dordia, who is Director for Circular Economy at the European Commission. We have Larissa Copello, who's a consumption and production campaigner with Zero Waste Europe. And we have Anik Carpentier, who is Director General for ACE, that's the Alliance for Beverage, Cartons, and the Environment. Thank you all so much for joining us. So, Ora, let's start with a question for you. The, the big change with this, because we had legislation dealing with this previously, right? And that was a directive. That was the PPWD. Uh, and now we have the PPWR. Can you explain to us why the Commission thought that this needed to change from a directive to a regulation? Just as background, a directive is where the EU sets goals for member states, national governments. They figure out their own way to get there. A regulation is directly, directly applicable. So why was this change needed in the Commission's mind? Directly applicable, this is part of the explanation of why the change was necessary, directly applicable. Uh, on the economic operators, why the directive is applicable to the member states and the member states must adopt uh, national legislation which transpose the directive in the terms of the national regulatory systems. And here the problems in a way appeared uh, during uh, the enactment of these national transposition uh, measures, many member states made their choices, legitimate choices, allowed by the directive, so not against uh, the directive, in terms of certain prohibitions or certain permissions, in terms of certain targets, more ambitious targets, labeling requirements, eliminating certain forms of packaging from their national market, so, fragmenting more and more what is supposed to be a single European uh, market for packaging and impinging also on the uh, way in which or the fluidity in which the products which are packed, packaged, uh, circulate on the single uh, market. So, uh, after listening to a lot of economic operators uh, and uh, at the hardship they experience in moving goods from a jurisdiction to another within the European, within the same single uh, market, we thought that it would be beneficial to uh, rekindle the debate with the member states about the best solutions, but in a different form, in to go um, at least two levels uh, deeper and to take a number of key decisions. Very difficult, it was time consuming, nerve. Uh, racking uh, debates, but I think it was useful to have a new discussion about the rules of the games uh, with the uh, member states, with the European Parliament and uh, with the economic uh, operators and the non-governmental organizations in order to have a more fluid single market for packaging and also for packaging waste. Larissa, from the perspective of groups campaigning for the reduction of waste, did you guys see this as an opportunity to strengthen the legislation? Did you have concerns that it could be, uh, you could end up with a loosening of the, the legislation? How did you guys feel about this whole project to redo it? Um, so indeed, we had mixed feelings in the beginning of directive or regulation. We thought, well, if it's a regulation, if it's very ambitious, then it's better. So it's a directly applicable and it's not happened. What's happened with the single use plastic directive, I think there are still so many member states which are kind of lacking behind the, the implementation. And there was misunderstanding as well in the implementation regarding uh, what is in the directive, for instance, uh, the, the composite packaging which is included in the single-use plastic directive was not perceived as, say, 
uh, by some member states. So as indeed there was like this uh, issue of implementation, but it's actually, it, it allows member states to indeed go beyond in some measures. So we see as well as a kind of a hybrid. I'm not sure if that's, uh, that is possible. Um, so in the end, I think it's a, it's a good compromise because the regulations applies directly, but it, it allows member states to go beyond in some measures to be more ambitious, hopefully. <laughs> I think this was a big legislative file that got a lot of attention. It required a lot of work from the people that are working in this sector uh, here in town and also all over. How does it feel to have it done? Are you happy with the result? And how do you feel about the transition from a directive to a regulation? We're very happy it's done indeed. No, it's been very intense for all stakeholders. And it can be explained through the fact that it does impact on basically all sectors in society. I mean, everyone is impacted by, by packaging and sees packaging. It's also the vision of it every day. I mean, if I take beverage carton, you have a, a beverage carton on your table basically every day with milk, juice, whatever. So it, it does impact everyone in his life or her life. And yes, we're very pleased as well that this is a piece of regulation and not a directive. Um, because indeed, uh, there are sustainability and innovation needs that are required through the PPWR, but also companies want to move forward in becoming more and more sustainable. But that, of course, requires investments, money. And if you have different requirements in different parts of Europe, and I mean, you were very gentle saying different member states, within a member states in some cases, you have different requirements, which, I mean, if you think about it, you know, you've got a factory that produces a product, say milk or juice, that is packed and then ship to Mars. Within the same country, you need different things. And now with the labeling requirements, it would mean even different labeling requirements within the same country. This is really diverting investment from where it should be. So we're very pleased, but indeed, we're also a bit uh, concerned in a way that member states can go further. Uh, to meet the recycling, and, and I'll make a point. Yeah, yeah, in a limited topics, way. But, but it <laughs> is true that it's breaking from it's, it's away from the classical the logic of the regulation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and very, very honestly, I mean, we hope that it will not impact too much the harmony of the single market. But we feel that it would be a bit strange in a way, moving to somewhat another subject, that member states do go further with their reuse targets because basically the recycling, recycling rates or recycling targets are not met. Whereas for us, the starting point of recycling is collection. And that's where member states are in charge. They are responsible for collection. Mm -hmm. If you do not collect waste or packaging yes. waste, you cannot recycle the packaging waste. Exactly. So it should all start with that, rather than going always further with ambitious requirements and targets. We should all start by educating consumers, by making the system working for collection, and industry can and must innovate and must invest in recycling. That's a no-brainer. But each of us, the Commission has taken its responsibility. Member states now need to take their responsibility. In, we need to take up our responsibilities in innovating and investing. Aura, let's, let's talk about consumers a bit, because as, as you mentioned, and the, the consumers are really at the heart of this proposal. This is a thing we all deal with every day, packaging, right? How are things going to change for consumers because of what was just agreed, as opposed to what exists right now for them? What are the main differences that they're going to see? Well, some of their habits and choices uh, will have to change. They will face more sustainable uh, um, uh, forms of packaging, uh, I think. And those who are take an interest in minimizing their environmental footprint will find a response to their concerns uh, there. Uh, they will have also to face situations where there will be no packaging. Uh, and uh, situations where instead of packaging, they will have to reuse uh, or refill uh, the recipients they were usually. So we will return on certain matters to the some of the good practices which were in Western and Eastern uh, European uh, countries uh, available some 40, 50 years uh, ago. Uh, in terms of reuse and uh, refill. So uh, th uh, this will impact certain uh, behaviors of the consumers. Uh, so 
Educating the consumer uh, is an important part. Uh, indeed, the consumer must be also more aware, contribute more to the separate collection of uh, the uh, packaging. And indeed, this will be indispensable if you want to have mandatory recycled content in uh, new uh, types of units of uh, packaging, you need to uh, recycle and to, co to collect, first of all, then uh, to uh, recycle. Probably one of the, the first things a <clears throat> consumer th would think about hearing that this legislation has been adopted is, well, what happens if there isn't compliance? So how do you enforce this legislation? How are you going to make sure that companies are following the rules, that national governments are enforcing the rules? What can the Commission do? Look, uh, there are two, at least uh, two factors which will play an important uh, uh, role here. The um, supervisory authorities, the market uh, uh, surveillance authorities in the member states, which usually police the rules of the single market, they will be called upon to have a look uh, also uh, at this and we will work with them. They are under the responsibility of another department in the European Commission with which uh, we work uh, rather closely. It's uh, the department in charge of single market and uh, entrepreneurship. And we will develop a, a program uh, in order to cooperate with the market surveillance authorities, also to share, to help them share experience about uh, this and also share some of our concerns and priorities uh, with them. But an important uh, role uh, will be played also by the, let's say, private enforcement or quasi-private uh, enforcement of this. So we count on competitors to spot when the market is uh, intruded by uh, uncompliant uh, packaging or by fake uh, issues and to flag this to the market surveillance authorities or to the European uh, Commission and we will take uh, action. So we rely on the self-interest of economic operators in uh, seeing and participating in a disciplined uh, market. So their vigilance is called upon, and I think they are, have the interest to be vigilant, and we say the door is open, just, uh, just uh, how to say, uh, gossip to us, and we'll take care. <laughs> T title tale. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, Larissa, uh, much has been made of the intense lobbying that we saw during this uh, uh, legislative process, as I referenced before. What's your perspective on where we ended up why do you think this attracted so much lobbying, this piece of legislation? And do you think that in the end, legislators in the European Parliament, in the European Council, uh, listened to science or were they swayed by uh, the different lobbying voices? Um, indeed, there was very intense lobbying. They gave me a lot of work. <laughs> we NGOs, we don't have capacity as industry has, not the same. Um, but yeah, indeed, it, it attracted lo lots of lobbying because it deals with all packaging plays in the market and it's like, it's huge. Um, so, well, from, from what we have started from the initial proposal and where we end up, of course, if I compare the initial proposal from the Commission and now, I would say it has been watered down, um, the ambition has been diluted. Um, but seeing, seeing like the, the before the directive, as it was only dealing with recycling, managing waste, um, and now we have a regulation for the first time preventing waste from happening in the first place with reuse measures, uh, with DRS, with market restriction bans. Um, so, I mean, we are, we, it's, a, it's a good step forward and um, we are very happy the legislation is, um, it's, it's, I mean, hopefully, yeah, it's almost, <laughs> it's almost <laughs> there. <laughs> um, We're cross fingers. Yes, yes. Um, and I think the uh, basic, like, what, what we need to, um, to, to be careful and be attentive will be indeed for the implementation and on the ground because there's a lot of exemptions that were added in the text 
from uh, the, the original proposal, let's say, for instance, the reuse targets, if member states achieving uh, X numbers of you know, recycling targets, the exemptions from the market restrictions as well. Um, so that we need to be careful uh, to not allow, uh, yeah, exemptions where it's not, uh, it's not uh, um, they would not uh, be uh, allowed to have it. Um, yeah. And it, there, there were a lot of different voices um, bending the ears of legislators during this process. Do you think that all the different sectors here were listened to equally by legislators? Did everybody have a chance to have their say here? Yes, uh, I do believe so. I mean, it was indeed very intense, also very polarized. Mm -hmm. Personally, but uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one, I regret a little bit the lack of time to, to share, to exchange because it was a very short process, even if you compare with the single-use plastic directive that was already very short, this one was like speed, really speedy process, which did not always, from all sides, the Commission, even the Parliament, yourself, ourselves, a lot of time to really exchange. And, and that led sometimes to very polarised and uh, positions, and for example, let's take uh, LCAs, which have been at the center of the battle many, many times. It's life cycle analysis. Yeah, life cycle analysis, sorry. Um, it's still the best scientific tool we have to assess the sustainability of a, you know, a life cycle of a product or a process, etc. Yet, it all depends on the assumptions you make from the start. Is it 10 times rotations, 20 times, 25? Is it 10 kilometers, 25, 100? It all depends on that. And so, of course, you can have LCAs giving slightly different results. And for me, it would have been really valuable to sit together with NGOs and maybe the Commission and say, OK, let's, let's agree on the assumptions from the start and see where it leads us. I cannot resist, I'm sorry, to say that uh, Zero Waste Europe, Europe and Reloop did a study a few years ago in 2020 in which it was said that aseptic beverage cartons have a lower carbon footprint than reusable packaging. Again, I can show you the study. <laughs> Don't worry, I checked my book. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, yes, there are cases where, indeed, single use may still be the best option versus reuse. And, and leading to, actually, the ambition of the proposal, the first thing I'd like to say is that the Commission's objective was to say that by 2030, all packaging would be recyclable and or reusable. That will be the case, I believe that goal will be achieved. Of course, implementation is key, etc. But that is there, certainly. In terms of reuse, yes, it may be seen as slightly watered down, but yet I think we move from nowhere to quite some ambition. And then we will see where the, where the market and where consumers lead us as well. The market can always decide to go further. There are reuse, if I take juice, for example, which is a very acid product, the only packaging you can use if you want a reusable packaging is glass, which is heavy, has a high carbon footprint, and therefore maybe not suited everywhere. But there are places in Germany or elsewhere where you have glass bottles with juice, which you can use as reusable. The market says it. But having a flat target across the EU from the north of Finland to the south of Greece or Portugal, that is something else. So I think there is some, some balance that has been brought to the text, not only on reuse, maybe on recycled content as well, where we're keen to use recycled plastic. We just need it available on the market, and that's not a given. So I think it was sound from the Commission to say, OK, we will check whether the technology and the material is available on the market. If it is, we could even increase the targets. If it's not, then we will review the targets. There is some good sense that has been brought to the text. Of course, each of us you know, may have wished something slightly different on this or this aspect. As I mentioned, we would have loved the collection target, but so it is. Aurel, I wanted to ask you about, uh, it's kind of a technical topic, but there was a bit of a, a glitch, let's say, at the end of the legislative process and this question over competence. So there was, the commission expressed concern about some changes made during the legislative process, uh, particularly regarding competences and issues that could have been deemed as trade or interfering with trade with third countries outside the EU. Could you explain what those reservations were and is the commission now satisfied with the end result here? 
Yeah, it was a reflection and a debate about what are the best uh, regulatory solutions uh, in order to preserve a level playing field without, uh, uh, let's say, uh, upsetting uh, in a radical way the trade with uh, third uh, countries. And uh, I think uh, after exchanging uh, different views about uh, what is the best uh, solution, uh, the Commission has uh, clearly, um, how to say, a line behind uh, the compromise struck by the European Parliament and by the Council. There are a number of internal lessons to be drawn uh, from this. I won't uh, comment on them uh, here, but uh, I think, uh, yeah, people reflect mm -hmm. about what has uh, happened, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, the uh, result is a good result and it signals certain things, gives a certain uh, signal to uh, both European manufacturers and manufacturers in uh, third countries. And we will take utmost care in order to put it into application uh, by acting in a geographically neutral, even-handed way, irrespective of the geographical origin of uh, virgin or recycl recycled uh, materials coming from Europe or from outside uh, Europe, and just uh, assessing the uh, material on its environmental and uh, carbon footprint merits. And so in the end, well, obviously, you know, the Commission at the most extreme level could have the power to pull a piece of legislation wouldn't be necessary in this case what's on the books so is okay. we lined up behind or we ranged behind this uh, legislative proposal as it stands now right so uh as as you referred to larissa we're not technically not quite there yet it's not in the official journal yet but we we assume it's it's going ahead so once it's then in the official journal, we then we have to, much. we hope it, very much, all fingers crossed. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because we have seen misadventures more recently. Well, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you never know what could pop up, but assuming this all goes to plan. It goes in the official journal, and then we're looking at the implementation phase. So for you guys, what are you going to be watching most keenly in terms of the first things to kick in? So the first things you're going to have to watch to make sure that the regulation is working as intended. Uh, so for us, we're going to focus on the implementation of reuse systems. Um, we are, as the Race Europe, we are also a network of organizations. So we have many members across member states that are doing implementation of, of zero waste uh, strategy, strategies. And for us, it's very important that the reuse systems, they are they're well designed and implemented from the start. Otherwise, you can just, yeah, we don't want an example of like, for instance, what happened with McDonald's in France, where they implemented the reuse system there, and there was not even incentive to return, and not even awareness raising with consumers. So consumers, they usually they go to McDonald's, it's fast food, they take it, and they go and they take it everything as, as a gadget. So they took all the, the packaging, <laughs> which was supposed to be reusable. <laughs> so it's, it lacked a lot of, uh, yeah, implementation and also a reuse systems there are like a criteria as well the same with single user for instance back like as well you need to have a system uh, designed to collect um, to return and all, all, and all of this um, so for the reuse systems to work we also need collaboration among uh, stakeholders like businesses they cannot compete, they, they need to share infrastructure, infrastructure for collection, for washing, all of this needs to be in place. So it's not time to compete. Um, I remember when I had discussions as well with some fast food change, I'm like, you need to collaborate, you need to have the same systems uh, and share, maybe harmonize packaging formats. But they say, no, but my product's different. I understand, okay, there's like different products, but a level of harmonization needs to be in place uh, so the systems can work smoothly and also convenient for consumers as well. So, yeah, we're going to be following it and also sharing best practice of what is working in each um, member state so we can uh, adopt, like, really implement well-designed reuse systems from the start. Yeah. And Nick, what will, we, what will you be watching most closely and most, um, let's say, given the, the earliest priority for uh, beverage cartons? The first thing we'd like to do is to offer all 
expertise to those who will be drafting the implementing and the delegated acts because it's it's impossible for anyone on this earth to know about all those packaging systems and technologies etc it's very complex in the i mean it's not an airplane let's face it but but it's complex to understand and we've seen even through this process sometimes some proposals which were actually proposing to ban some things which are on the market and recycled and recyclable so we believe that you know we can bring expertise of course it will always be up to GRC and the member states to decide at the very end but I think that it would be a pity to do without the expertise that is available there and uh, and then that is put openly and transparently on the on, on the place so that it can be discussed so that's the first thing we'd like to do the second thing for us is clearly um, that first we're very pleased to have predictability so that our members can start really in I mean they have started already but really investing our companies aim to have a beverage carton that, that is only made from renewable or recycled material by 2030. So we're moving towards that. But of course, innovation needs to be at scale, which is not just you know 5% of the market, but really at scale. Second priority is, of course, to get collected. And as I said, we're not totally in charge of that. So we are working with member states. We are trying to convince member states to adopt targets. Uh, we are offering help to educate consumers. We are pushing for harmonized systems as well, because the, for consumers it needs to be clear and easy. If you are collected with paper five kilometers away and then 10 kilometers away, you're collected with plastic, consumers are confused. So you, you need to have all that in mind and we try to identify national strategies for collection. Recycling investments are in place, 200 million already invested in recycling, uh, another 150 million to be invested mainly in the non-fiber components recycling. By 2030 all beverage cartons will be 100% recyclable and recycled. All those that are collected of course, what is not collected, you know, you have some people who throw it nevertheless in the black bin or who will in some countries burn it or whatever. You cannot avoid that. But we're really aiming at getting all of the beverage content back and recycling them all. Or else, so uh, Nick mentioned that there will be implementing work that the Commission needs to do in the coming years. But in terms of uh, what's going to need to be happening out there in the member states among companies, what is the Commission going to be watching most keenly in the early years? And which area do you think is most likely to bring infringement action? <laughs> I well, can't. hopefully none, because everybody <laughs> will have the interest to comply from the beginning. Uh, but I would like to say, I mean, we couldn't see more eye to eye with the uh, industry. Who said that DG Environment is not uh, is polemicizing with the industry? No. And uh, seriously speaking now, we uh, fully share, uh, maybe in a bit of a different order, but doesn't mean a difference in order of uh, magnitude. And also we share the same uh, priorities with the um, environmental uh, uh, NGOs. So it is important indeed to have implementing rules that are realistic and actually as the regulation is the expression of a societal compromise, it reflects the compromise of the European societies and of the member states and of the societal sectors and economic uh, sectors that could be reached in the uh, uh, year of grace 2024. So the implementing acts uh, uh, authorizing different things must be the expression we want to consult the industry and must be the expression of a compromise between public authorities and private actors, between economic interests and environmental uh, concerns. And we should be able to strike um, uh, the fair balance and hopefully this will reduce very much the desire and the need, including the political need of the member states, to depart from the shared rules in a few limited uh, areas where they uh, have created a room for uh, expansion for uh, themselves. We share the importance also of uh, radically improving the separate collection 
of uh, packaging and the recycling. There is no recycling at scale. There is no, uh, there is no, not enough feedstock to meet the recycled content uh, obligations if we do not manage, and there is ultimately no virtuous environmental uh, improvement, or more, no uh, environmental uh, improvement uh, if we do not manage uh, to uh, improve in some of our member states radically the collection rate uh, of the packaging uh, waste and the development of infrastructure uh, and the investments necessary in order to recycle these materials back into packaging or in other, uh, in other uh, applications uh, for this. So we are committed to work hand in hand and the reuse and the refill uh, uh, systems must deliver their expected environmental uh, improvements as well. So we are ready uh, and we need not to work in a dark corner in our offices, but in full light and together indeed, by, uh, together with the industry, by drawing inspiration from the, their experience, from the technologies available on the market, from the experience accumulated from trials and errors uh, in the past, so we don't need to reinvent uh, the wheel. And I think there is also a shared interest of the public authority, so I trust that the member states, I, I am convinced, not uh, I'm, that I trust, I am convinced the member states want also to learn uh, from this and to identify a common uh, denominator and also want to support the economic operators which brings uh, jobs and growth uh, in their uh, jurisdictions. Well, we shall see. It'll be interesting to see how, of, how all of this translates into our real-life experience. It's one of those areas here in Brussels where you can see the results of something you've worked on right there at the grocery <laughs> store, right there at the fast food chain. Uh, and so we'll see how the implementation goes. I want to thank all three of you for joining us here today. And thank you at home for watching this edition of your Active Policy Triangle Debate. We'll see you right back here for the next one.